Hi there, I'm Barbara Turley and you're watching Feminine Wealth TV, the show that uncovers the diamond tips on creating truly conscious wealth from change makers, world shakers and wealth creators. Let me ask you a question. Would you have the guts, with no experience in the magazine industry, to do one of the biggest magazine launches in your country's history? I don't think I would either, but I'm excited because today I'm interviewing the amazing Lisa Messenger who has done exactly that. Lisa is the founder and creative director of the Messenger Group. She is the editor-in-chief of the amazingly successful Renegade Collective magazine, which is now in 29 countries around the world. Lisa, welcome to the show. You're so good. Thank you. So <laughs> nice to be here. I was just thinking, gosh, how do you remember all of that? <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of practice. <laughs> Thank you, really yeah. special to be here, particularly because I think you were pretty much almost the first person who interviewed me just after That's launch, right. which is yeah. 14 Had you even ago. launched it? I think it was just the day or two days after the launch. It might have been, yeah. yeah. And yes, and that was a pretty extraordinary time, and things have got more and more extraordinary yeah. on the way. Yeah. yeah, so talk to me. I mean, where did the, I, I'm interested to know, and I think I probably asked you this last time. Mm. Did you just wake up one morning and go, I think I'm going to launch a magazine? You I'm know gonna what? rival Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I thought I did, but I've just actually um, yesterday finished yeah. my next book, which comes out in September. Oh, and yes. through that process, I really had to dig deep into when did the idea yes. come about. I thought I walked into my office in March 2012, mm. so nearly just over two years ago, um, and just decided that day, you know, let's do a magazine. Yes. But my deputy editor, Mel, who's worked with me on and off for nine years, mm. reminded me that in 2007, her and I were sitting in Morocco after the Frankfurt Book Fair, and I had said back then, I think I need to do a magazine. Yeah. And then I looked at, I think, 2009, I actually registered a company name called uh, Messenger Magazines. And then uh, about, so a year sowing that seed. <laughs> about a year <laughs> later, I'd bought um, a book called How to Launch a Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'd forgotten all these things. Um, you know, but as we went through the writing of the book process, it kind mm. of came back to me. So it wasn't necessarily a conscious thing, and uh, it was something that had been building and manifesting for a while, and I obviously wasn't ready at the time. But um, yeah, when I was ready, it, it kind of went big. <laughs> I just love that because so many times in our lives, you know, we do things like you buy a domain name, yeah. or you find yourself buying a book, and yeah. you think, I don't really know what I'm doing with this, or yeah. you meet someone and you just you connect with them and you don't yeah. really know why, but yeah. it comes back later. Yeah, absolutely. And you realize where all the dots connect later yeah. on, you know. I, and that's the thing, and I think, you know, uh, people say, oh, you know, to any one of us, oh, you're such a success. And I think there's, and then you kind of go, yes, it's the 13 year overnight success, uh, yeah, you yeah. know, that old adage. And I think when you look back, there's definitely times and stepping stones and things that have kind of, you know, morphed mm. together to create this mm. moment in time. Yeah. So, yeah. And also, I mean, as you say, like it's a 13 year overnight success. I mean, yeah. you've been an entrepreneur for as long as I can remember anyway. You've probably been an entrepreneur your whole life. Yeah. Where did it sort of all start, the whole entrepreneurial thing? Look, I think when I got fired from my last job. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible employee. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a real brat I was. Mm. No, I look, I think, um, you know, every business that I ever worked for, I wanted to have equity in the company. Yeah. Not that I knew what equity meant. She was clever <laughs> early on. You didn't need to know what it meant. You just knew the money was there. <laughs> Literally. No, I think that was a, you know, ego thing before I'd done too yeah. much work on myself or, you know, as probably a Gen Y well before the term Gen Y was coined. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was. And... Um, and it wasn't until, you know, my brattishness. I mean, I, every job I worked in, I always had, you know, a modicum of success and moved up and mm. up quite quickly and, um, you know, and did well. But I think, yeah, my last job, I became too much for them and, you yeah. know, and too much for Brat. And they said it's probably time to part ways. And they were so extraordinary, extraordinarily supportive and actually said, why don't you start a sponsorship agency, which was oh, a, right, essentially okay. saying to set up in direct competition with them, which was quite gorgeous of them and really supportive, and, mm. and so I did. <laughs> but um, Little did they know what a, what a competitor <laughs> you were going to be. <laughs> yeah, so, and that was, yeah, nearly 13 years ago, and mm. I've had so many different iterations of, you know, that particular business, and it's morphed and pivoted and changed with mm. the market, and, um, and, you know, and several other businesses across several different industries yeah. as well in that time. I love that you said there that you've, you've allowed it to morph and evolve and pivot and change yeah. because as we know when you start out 
you've got this big idea and then yeah. you've got to move quickly if things don't really go your way or if things don't pan out. So yeah. what, what was the sort of first pivot that you did, I guess, after that sponsorship? Business? So, yes, yeah, so thank you. it's a really important point because um, I've always sort of said, you know, it's a good skill to learn detachment from outcome because mm. I see so many people in business continuously kind of saying, well, this is where I want to be and that's the only place I want to be. And what happens is you set yourself up for failure over and over again, yeah. whereas the market changes. When I started that sponsorship agency initially, it was 22nd of October 2001, which was just after the hideous September 11. Oh, that's you right. Know, yeah. yeah. And so it, so it was the only time I've seen my father cry <laughs> because he said, why would you start a business now? And leave your safe job. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it was, you know, there was a lot of economic downturn. And so the problem with... Sponsorship essentially means getting you know money for sponsorable assets. I I was working across the arts and entertainment mm. industry, and you know companies like um, BMW who just parted with 1.3 mil for Cirque du Soleil, you know, just months before that, were suddenly saying no, we can't do anything, and mm. so that was continuously happening. So whilst I was attracting amazing clients very quickly, the dollars just weren't there, and so I had to kind of be open-minded enough to think, right, well. If that's not going to work, what am I going to do? So yeah. I became an integrated marketing agency, which I laugh at because yeah. really I had no marketing background whatsoever, and and my background and my um my turnover was about fifty grand a year, and I was over servicing and undercharging, having a hell of a lot of fun, but absolutely no idea. Yeah, I just want to stress this point because a lot of particularly female entrepreneurs out there are doing this. Yes. Undercharging and over servicing. I was the queen problem. of it for yeah. at least three years. I am. Um, I mean, it was. Possibly almost, apart from this iteration, the happiest I had ever been. I was <laughs> yeah. loving what I was doing because yeah. I was so excited to be working with people and helping them. And But then, you know, about three years into it, I hit a brick wall of massive resentment because I got to a point where, you know, my lifestyle was suffering. Yeah. I didn't really have a lifestyle. Yeah. I was working my butt off. These, all these other people that I was working for were reaping their rewards mm. and I was selling myself short and not valuing my time. And um, and so, yeah, so I hit a big wall of resentment yeah. and really that's when I turned things around and made it much more commercial. You know what I, I love about the fact that you said that because I think a lot of women feel, you know, I love giving. Yeah. And I, I just want to give to all my clients. And yeah. I say to them, but the problem is that even if you don't realize it, if the value exchange is not honored mm. in terms of, you know, you give value yes. and you get value back in yes. the form of money or yes. something else. Value exchange is my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the value exchange. And actually, it does build resentment. And even if you don't realize it consciously, mm. your clients start to feel resentment from you mm. because you're not getting being honoured yeah. in return yes I've, I love that you that you said that yeah. absolutely absolutely and I think it's really important and I really like what you just said as well because I think one of the problems and the perception is that money is the only currency yeah. and in fact there's so many ways to you know to value exchange and now and you're probably the same so many people say mm. to me can I have a coffee with you to pick your brains I hear oh, you're yes. the guru of and I say no you can't yeah. but if someone wants to meet me and I mean not just physically meet me but you know meet me a meeting of the minds where they feel they're my mm. equal and they're not just it's not just a one-way energy sap and I'm happy to talk yes. to anyone about their business but yeah. not when you know those ones where you just walk away from an hour and you think I am so freaking exhausted yeah, because they just took they've the just taken the whole thing and I think that's the problem I believe everyone is equal and everyone has equal ability to mm. share and uh, you know and if they can step up to the plate and meet me then I'm happy to do so it somebody, yeah, so even somebody in an early stage of business has yeah. something to offer yeah. to somebody you know that is at, at a different level to them so Absolutely. always think about that that you can offer something yeah so it's, yeah. About, it's about people valuing themselves you know um, and it's also about you know, I have it a lot now. People just come to me and say, you know, can you do an article on the ma in the magazine on me because I am blah, blah, blah. You know, that they are so fabulous. And I'm like, well, that's fine, but you haven't yeah. really, you know, it's nice to come to, to the party with, well, what's in it for you, what's in it for me? And yeah. if they say, and I'd love to share it across social media or I'd love to da da da, da or whatever it is, and yeah. just try and And think about your objectives of, as well, yeah. what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah. and I think... Um, you know, we're all busy people, and I'm certainly becoming increasingly busy. Yeah. And I think if someone comes to the party having actually thought about where that value exchange is mm -hmm. and where it can work for both parties, whatever it is in life or in business, I think it's a much more 
true and authentic, authentic exchange. Yeah. So after the the marketing business, I mean, yes. I won't say after because again, again, <laughs> it another kind of kept issue. Going. It's still going. Yeah, it's still there. And <laughs> yeah. And what? How did you? So when you say you changed three years in, you're not making any money. Things yeah. are kind of a bit messy. Yeah. What did you do to fix it? Because sometimes it's such a mess that you think, oh, how am I going to fix this now? You know? Yeah. Look, I I actually I went to this course, um, and I think it's important to invest in yourself. And it was mm. by Matt Church, who I'm sure. Oh you yes, know. yeah. And uh, it was, I think it was like $1,200 for a two-day course. And um, and at the time, I thought, oh, there's so much money. Oh, Again, yeah. about... You think, am I splashing out? Yeah. I, oh, my God, what am I doing? Yeah. You know what? Best $1,200 I ever spent. Because mm. in that time, you know, A, it made me step up and be surrounded by extraordinary people who were going to lift me higher. And B, I walked away with three clients from that weekend. This, oh, um, you know, to the value money. of 40 to 60 grand each now actually I've missed missed a part but I had yeah. sort of started a um, book publishing business in between and right. uh, and that just came out of you know a completely different space and my first book I wrote was called happiness is and yes. it was because I was so unhappy after <laughs> I was servicing and under charging for three years and I had some personal stuff I was going through at the time and and I'd been in the service industry for a while and I mm. thought I really want to produce a product and so you know what better product to produce than a book that I have no experience in <laughs> you have a history or self publishing <laughs> well yeah. I am a disruptor and yeah. I purposefully go about finding you know even though I didn't know that that's what I yeah. was back then I certainly know that I am now and I purposefully go um, into industries that you know our age old industries mm. that are doing things the same way over and over again and I come in from a completely different direction and I did that with Happiness Is mm. um, and yeah and I sold 36,000 copies in the first 12 months and the yeah. best seller in Australia at the time and I think still is is 5,000 and but I did it completely non-traditionally, so I pre-sold yeah. it to corporates and used my sponsorship model basically to yeah, do that. Yeah. So, and yeah. what I what I love actually, I've been reading. I mean, I've been watching you for a long time now, and I, I know that with the with the magazine, it's interesting to hear that you you learned that distribution piece in that in the book publishing area. Yeah, yes. Because I will say, I mean, with business and you know, in terms of wealth, building wealth through business, there's yeah. really only two things you need to think about. Yeah. It's value and leverage. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know? And actually <laughs> it is actually that simple, right? Yeah. I mean there's obviously a lot in there to do. But yeah. with the magazine and I you know, this distribution thing you talked about with the book, but with the magazine I noticed that, you know, you go in you create a magazine even though there's five and a half thousand magazines already in the Australian market. Mm. But you create one that actually isn't there, and it's yeah. about entrepreneurship, and it's about—it's such an amazing magazine. So you Thank find you. a gap, yes, and you create this value to fill that gap. Yeah, and then the distribution piece, which is the leverage piece, mm. I just love how you've done that because Thank you kind you. of sold it before you created it. Yes, yes, mm. and that's what I do in every single. I mean, I've worked across now oh, so many different industries. Mm. You know, publishing, marketing, social media. Um, I've done books on surfing I've done books on property I'm a property investor I've, I've yeah. morphed and gone across a number of different industries and because I almost do it to push myself and test myself because yeah. when people say you can't do that it's like a red rag to a bull so I want to keep yeah. testing it across multiple industries and showing that actually you can come in knowing absolutely nothing like I know absolutely nothing about most of the industries mm. like nothing I've I have a good strong sense of business acumen now mm. but I don't know the industries before I enter them and I certainly knew nothing about magazines whatsoever mm. and uh, none of my staff purposefully knew anything about magazines when I launched and you might say yes I've had a book publishing business and I've written several books before but they're it's quite one-dimensional yeah. yeah it's a very very different game um, the thing about it is, and actually I'm going to yeah. hold it up, this yeah, is the, this latest, is the latest issue, issue. Blondie. Mm. Um, the thing about it is, and you've kind of hit the nail on the head, you would think um, that you know it would have been done in some iteration or other before. The thing is, I'm an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, so mm. I've literally gone, I am so frustrated, there's nothing out there that's inspirational and aspirational mm. and stories about extraordinary individuals and businesses, and so I've created it. But... I haven't just gone out and created something that looks like a business magazine and is expected. Yeah. I have purposefully and very, very consciously created something that looks like a fashion yeah, it's magazine. It's like Vogue. It's like yeah. a Vogue magazine. And yeah. that is very, 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 very purposeful because if I, as you said, there's over 
five and a half thousand print magazines in Australia alone. Mm. We're now in 29 countries, so I'm competing with a lot of different magazines mm. out there. And I knew that I needed it to sit in the newsstand and everywhere else in the top 10 magazines, mm. um, you know, globally. And so to do that, I have to play the game and make it look like all of them. So the thing is, you know... But yet it's really different, because when I go, into, the, yes. the, I go into a shop in newsstand and you see it... And it is between Vogue and Marie Claire yes, and Elle, yes. but it's very obvious that this magazine is about totally different things, oh, good. Well, which I, I quite like, because it does stand out there. I mean, maybe just because I know it, but yeah. even, you know, the front cover of this one, for example, the rise of blogging. Yes, well, I always you play know, with the cover lines, so yeah. whilst, um, whilst the visual might look like the others, yes. I, you know, my cover lines are very, very strongly entrepreneurial. It mm. is an entrepreneurial magazine, absolutely first and foremost above all else. Mm. Um, but hopefully, you know, the beauty of that is that hopefully we're picking up a lot of other people who are potential entrepreneurs because they think it's fashion or whatever, and then they read it and go, oh my God, I didn't realize. And well, so I, I mean, I love that the, the fact that is that it's really going to appeal to the female market. And I mean, the wave of women launching their own businesses globally is yes. absolutely massive. Huge. Right so so huge. this is, is a magazine that's... I mean, it's not all. About, I mean, I love the fact that it, it doesn't even have a bent towards women. It's got a lot of men in the magazine. No, as well. and I have to say, but the I cover is yeah. really attractive for women. You and know? thank you. And you, mm. the thing is, you can't be everything to everyone. Mm. But it's interesting. I had a reader dinner um, three nights ago up in um, Nuribar near, near Byron Bay, and mm. um, and the ex head of uh, CEO of Billabong came along. He'd been oh. with Billabong twenty six years, and he said to me. He came up to me and he said, Lisa, I picked up the first copy of your magazine with Lorna Jane on the cover in the Qantas Lounge. And he said, I have been hooked ever since. Yeah. And this is a guy, I guess, early 50s, I would imagine. And so it's, you know, that kind of thing really... It's really good. Yeah, and I, I have actually a lot of men come to me who have... Most, more often than not accidentally come across it because they think it's a women's magazine. Yeah. And they are hooked. And I've even had... Um, you know, husbands and wives almost arguing in front of me <laughs> going, I discovered it first. And I'm like, wow, it's, yeah. so that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And what about, so I want to talk a little bit now about the leverage piece. So yes. like the, you, you very much got the distribution piece right first in, in two ways. You did, uh, you organized distribution in Australia pretty much straight away. Yes. Before, so the 100,000 magazines were printed. Yes. But then you also organized uh, corporate sponsorship so that the cash flow end of kind of keeping this magazine mm. going mm. was covered, yes. which is so clever. <laughs> so talk to me about the, the, the first the, the distribution in the, in the newsstands. Yeah, so I'll go. Yeah, I'll go yeah. back a little bit. And thank you. You always do your research so well. Yeah. I love that. Do you want <laughs> yeah, a job? I know all about you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what happened was, and it's really interesting going back to my business plans anyone who knows me knows that means back of the envelope <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, and I love that about me too actually because I'm a fan of that <laughs> <laughs> it's about as complex as I get but it was interesting because with the book side of the business um, I have always known how to sell pre-sell books to yes. corporates that so did you learn that in that initial sponsor publishing sponsorship sponsor sort of thing? that yeah. was learned um, when I looked at happiness is and I heard that 5,000 was a bestseller in Australia and I thought, this is ridiculous. I applied my sponsorship knowledge and thought, why don't I pre-sell it to corporates? Because by my way of thinking, which is always just whatever the logic is at the time or the illogic in my mm. head, um, I co thought corporates have so many inanimate objects like squidgy balls and mouse pads and oh, yeah. coffee mugs. And, and I know the kind of money golf they tees. spend, golf yeah. tees, and the, don't yeah. start me. Ugh. And I just thought, why... You know, what in the case of happiness is, well, why can't they buy a beautiful book to use as a premium incentive gift or reward for their clients instead of this crap? Mm. And so I went to them and said, I'm producing this beautiful book. So in that instance, Mercedes bought several thousand copies to incentivize test drive. You go along, you mm. drive your Mercedes. At the end of it, they say, oh, we'd love to give you this. You know, it's that surprise and delight yes, factor. Yeah. Clever. So then what happens so is different. people go and say, I just drove a Mercedes. Oh, my God, I got this book. Yeah. Um, Clinique had a perfume called Happy. So they bought several thousand. It was like, buy a bottle of Happy for 140 bucks or something, get a free book valued at $40. But did you pitch this at them, though? I pitched, or did they come to you? No, I pitched all of this. Yeah, that's so you made and, a list of what you were thinking yes, might work. Yeah. And important to note that all of that happened before I'd written a word of the book. Like, literally. It yeah. was this all... 
every business. Now that I takes have, balls. <laughs> well, it's how it I do everything. Yeah. I, I come up with an idea. I back of the envelope. It in the case of happiness is a few design spreads. I went to them and explained it. And I think when you've got the passion. Look at these birds, isn't that I lovely? I it's lovely, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just, and, um, you know, then people people will buy it. And uh, and so that's what happened. And it went on and on. And um, Officeworks bought a whole lot of things. Mm. You know, buy, spend $200 with Officeworks, get a free copy of the book. So I did lots and lots of deals. So coming back to the magazine, mm. because I'd been doing that with books for so many years, I actually never really considered newsstand I sort of thought that would be secondary and I actually thought that the magazine would be very much the same as the book model and I would go and pre-sell you know 10,000 copies to Commonwealth Bank or whatever it was and that they would use it to give to their Ah, customers so I went and did that quite successfully and Combank was one of my initial partners Mm. and several other corporates who use the mag who agreed to use the magazine as part of their you know for their private clients or their women's part of the business or whatever it was and then I had a meeting with um Gordon and Gotch who are the there's two big distributors in Australia anyway they just about fell over themselves about the magazine and so then I thought and then I made a very conscious decision right I want to I don't want to be just known for doing what I've done for the last eight years, which is successfully selling into corporates. Mm. I want to be equally, you know, equally mm-hmm. playing with the newsstand and the subscriptions and all of the other model as mm. well. So I made a very conscious decision then and there to divide the, the revenue stream 50-50. Mm. And, um, and so then newsstand and traditional just went nuts and I couldn't believe that here I was being a, a real player against the likes of Bauer and Pac Mags and yeah. Newslife Media. I mean, they're massive in Australia and I have utmost respect for them. Bauer has over 80 magazines and there we were sitting and in the middle. still are and yeah. on the rise, um, you know, smack bang in the middle of these guys. And yeah. so I've, I've taken both, both paths equally as, as yeah. importantly. And same for overseas. We launched in 11, in 11 countries and we're now in 29. And, uh, and that should be 50 by Christmas. So I'm. Um, That's amazing. I, I, and I'm building out several other revenue streams now. We're really um, productizing and, uh, you know, the online yes. and the digital is really building out. And there's a lot of pretty exciting things happening. Yeah. And for me now, it's very much around um, platform agnostic. So mm. I don't want to be just print magazine it's Mm. you know you want to read it when you want to read it on the device you want to read it how you want to read it or you want to attend an event when you want it how you want it or you want to see yeah so there's lots and lots of things happening building it i mean the the, so so obviously the magazine is like your front end piece and then there's a big back end business being built off the back of that yeah and i really (laughs) want to stress that point insanely big business being built at the moment yeah i I really want to stress that point for people that you know you can from something like a magazine or a book or Particularly for the authors out there, for, if you want to produce a book, yes. remember that the book is just the front end business card, really. Yeah. I mean, and eventually. Yeah. So, so talk to me about what the the, the big build is going to. Can you can you share some of the some of the ideas that might be coming? Oh, uh, bits of it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> we'll try and get a little bit more. <laughs> so, so obviously, digital is going to be huge. Digital is going to be huge. Yeah. Um, the magazine is very different to the book because with the books, mm. I've always said, and I've written several books on this if anyone wants mm. any of them, but I've always said don't think $30 book, think $30,000 client. It's a different uh, yeah. model to the magazine completely. Mm. Um, but I think with books, people should produce them and, you know, it's read my book about it. I'm yeah, gonna what's give, your book called? Oh, so I've got one called Books to Boost, Boost Your Brand and then I've got a marketing book on how to market so, okay. And yeah. it basically takes everyone through step by step exactly how I think books can be used to leverage and as a brand building and a credibility piece and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've always said, you know, give away your books because, you know, it builds your Business profile cards. up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to trip myself up though because my book, which comes out in September, I'm definitely not giving it away because I don't have a back end around that anymore. Well, that's, that's a pure book. Yeah, yeah. It's a pure book and it's very much, um, you know, it's it's the last two years journey pretty much and it's all my philosophies and things and so I won't give it away because uh, it, I don't have I don't have a back end of that yeah. business this is sort of my brain on the plate and if you want it spend yeah. 29 <laughs> what's the book that book called so you it's want actually September. called um, Daring and Disruptive <laughs> oh I like it Daring and Disruptive so watch out for that book coming out in September yeah <laughs> so that's exciting um, with the magazine though it's it's different you know again it's not 
it's definitely not a business card. It is, mm. you know, it's nine ninety five and it's it's not expensive, but it, it it's sta- it's a very much a standalone thing. But you know, even if we sell globally half a million copies of the mag each mm. month, which would be nice, we're not there yet. Yeah. Um, then you know, you still online if you're doing that across twenty nine countries, you can be reaching you know a oh. hundred million people, yeah. and so. I love print and I'm a big advocate of the tangible physical product. Mm. I think there are you know, so many reasons for it, strategically and consumer-wise and all sorts of things. But you know, digital really opens us up to entirely different platforms and also because it is the collective and it's about very much the mm. community. I mean, I am just the conduit for that. Mm. Um, the digital will allow people to actually have a space for themselves. So there'll be a lot of user-generated content oh, yeah. as well, So which which I love. So people can really share their own journeys and experiences. Yeah, and their own. That's a really mm. nice idea. Yeah, so the community a, aspect. Yeah, yeah, that's what it's about. I mean, I am just literally, I am just the person who, you know, had the idea and mm. kind of, um, creates the architecture around it, but it's very much around the community and creating this hub mm. for everyone. So yeah, the digital will be big, and then really products. So we're starting to do a lot of collaborations, and that will be. Um, look, Martha Stewart has eight and a half thousand products to her name, so yeah. I have a little way to go. <laughs> but um, that's we're going down a similar trajectory. Yeah. As long as the products, um, you know, fit within the value and belief system, and yeah. are on purpose and are giving back to the entrepreneurial community, then that's kind of where we're building out as well. And oh god, so so many things. So there's some TV stuff in the works, and yeah, yeah it's a uh, it'll yeah be an interest. It's a, it is an interesting journey. Yeah. So I want to talk to you a little bit now about, I mean, obviously with, you know, the launch of this magazine, it was a one and a half million dollar launch, mm. biggest one in Australian history. Well, that was, mm. I have to correct you. The, yeah. the one and a half million dollars wasn't big, it was for me, yeah. but, um, but it was in terms of the distribution footprint, yes, it's the biggest there. in Australian history. No one had ever been anywhere near how many... Um, outlets and channels we had from launch. So, yeah. yeah. But, st- I mean, you know, I mean, a launch of that size for you personally, for your business, is oh, quite a big... Massive. You know, it was, it was, well, it was taking a leap of faith, which involves mm. risk. Mm. And I know as women, we, and a gross generalization, I know, but women in general, we're not as comfortable with taking risk as men are. So I want to know um, how, what would you say to women entrepreneurs out there about taking those big risks? And, you know, what what's the... Is it feel the fear and do it anyway, or is it a sort of a, you know, trusting? <laughs> For me, it definitely is. And, I mean, I get asked a lot about this. How don't, mm. how don't I have fear anymore? How do I... I mean, the, mag, the magazine alone, mm. print magazine alone, of which it is currently one of 18 different revenue streams, costs me now 350000 Australian dollars a month to mm. put out. Mm. Actually, it's more than that now because we've just upped the yeah. global print run. But, um, you know, it's, it's not small change. Mm. And, uh, and then there's a lot of other things going on. Um, so... My answer around it is this. I think, because I've had to reverse engineer and because it's become so intuitive to me just yeah. taking a risk and not f- feeling fear. And so I've really had to do some work on thinking, well, how did I get to that point? And the reality around it is I think in 13, nearly 13 years of business, there's probably not a situation I haven't experienced in some mm. shape or form. And so what I do is I let my brain very quickly go to the worst case scenario, yes. which at the moment is often around finance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, just, you know, not that it's a bad thing. It's just that with this extraordinary growth, and I've chosen at this point not to have any um, equity partnerships yeah. or investors, and so I have to keep rolling it on my own, and that means a lot of partnerships, mm. you know, on a daily basis. Um, so, so I go to the worst case scenario and then my brain can very quickly, like in literally 30 seconds to two minutes, say, yeah. stack, go through a sort of stack of cards in my head and go bang, 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 and bring it back to current situation. Yeah. And then I can quickly go, oh, okay, now I know what to do. I know I need to speak to my CFO or I need to get another investor or I need to speak to my lawyer or, yeah. you know, have a chat to the team and I can quickly put mechanisms in place. And so... I think to be able to learn that and know that, you know, in 13 years I haven't gone under and that Mm. we always come out the other side and so I'm able to push the risk and the, you know, the, uh, yeah, and push my pain threshold a bit further each time. Mm. And, uh, but you know, you've got to have absolute unwavering 
unshakable self belief. Yes, self belief. I mean, yeah. you have to. You cannot do this any other way. And and it's really interesting that you know going between ego because you have to have a certain amount of yeah. that, and you know, um, and then real self awareness around that, yeah. and knowing when ego is stepping in and being able to quash it. And that's yeah, knowing of, the difference between ego and actually logical and, thought that yeah. is well thought out. Yeah, yeah, and having enough, having that self belief and, and self-esteem mm. as opposed to ego. I think there are a lot of people out there who, particularly mm. politicians and unfortunately <laughs> yeah. people in major corporate roles who have massive ego, yeah. low self-esteem. Um, it's a very, very scary mix and I see it played out time mm. and time again. So, you know, and there is no quick fix or fast appeal to it. You know, sometimes when I'm doing speaking on stage and people say, how have you got to this point? And I say, 10 <laughs> years of therapy. And they look at me deadpan. And part yeah. of me says it for shock value. And part of it's true, you know. It's I've true, worked yeah. my freaking butt off through personal development and all sorts yeah. of other things to get to a place where well, that's really real, real self-belief as well, instead of just, you know, I believe in myself because that's coming from ego. Yeah. But I love as well that you said you go straight to the worst case scenario. Because yeah. one thing I try to, when I'm coaching people and talking to people about taking risks, because I yeah. spent a long time in trading and risk mm. is just part of everyday life. Yes. Well, for yeah, people exactly. in that game. That's high adrenaline. Yeah. And, and really, you mm. know, the trick really, people always get carried away with how much money will I make. Mm. And I always go, well, the first thing I do is go, how much could I lose? Yeah. And what are the different scenarios around that? Yeah, and what yeah. would you do? And what would it do to you? Yeah. All those different scenarios. Because the upside, if it goes up or something goes the way you want it to, well, that's all great. It you doesn't only, matter. Yeah. You only need to worry about the other end. So yeah. you, you risk mitigate for that and you just try to yeah, and it's, manage it's, for that and be aware. Exactly. And then have the belief to kind of take it forward. Uh, yeah. And it's, mm. it's constant um, risk mitigation at the moment in terms of just knowing, you know... Um, you know, I've got many things in place so mm. that, you know, if something goes awry, well, I've got a fallback and then another fallback and then yeah. another fallback because, you know, it's um, it's like any business and I'm certainly not alone. When you have mm. that high growth, just cash flowing that is... It's um, difficult. And it's hard yeah. because, you know, with this business, I know with every ounce of my being exactly where I want it to go at the moment and I could throw another 20, 30, 40 staff at it today, not a problem. Yeah. And, you know, and build out more countries and build out more product. Like, I, I just know exactly where it's mm. going. And uh, so, you know, that's that tricky decision of do I take someone do on you go who all can in? just yeah. chuck 100 mil at me quick? <laughs> <I know. laughs> or yeah. do I just keep trying to bounce along and at the moment I'm trying to do it myself yeah, yeah. because as well I think for me you know I'm a crazy creative big visionary and I don't necessarily want someone who comes in and <laughs> and looks at it I just yeah. had my accountant for four months last year because he just kept looking at my bottom line and saying Lisa <laughs> and when you sit there and go it's gonna be okay Greg they, yeah, they try they just don't doing get it. No. And so the thing is, I don't necessarily want you know a big partner in at the moment because I think they could potentially quash the uh, creativity and the momentum that we have going. Yeah, so. and I think that's a good, really good point that you've made because a lot of people are out there looking for investors, and I always sort of say, "There's a lot." I mean, I'm a fan of bootstrap the hell out of it and just mm. do it yourself yeah. because otherwise, you know, it's not just the money that you get. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, you can get mentorship and all that sort of thing as well, but they yeah. are going to come in. It's their money, right? So yeah. Yeah. they're going to come in and want to know what the hell's going on. Yeah, you and know? the thing is, um, you know, when you go as big as I've chosen to go, there's going to be very few people. Who who You're are going to come in and actually yeah. understand? Uh, and yeah, it's hard to explain. I do so much on um, mm. that and intuition, and that's just not going to cut it for some No, for the investors. Go, I yeah. want this, this, but that's this, what, this. what makes you the entrepreneur that you are. <laughs> so, yeah. speaking of gut and intuition, and sort of you know going close to the edge all the time and living every day a little bit like on that edge. Yes, I want to talk about feminine flow. And yes. as women, you know, I know that you've suffered adrenal fatigue as uh, yeah. lots of women in the, yeah. know, we, we push ourselves like mad and we yeah. push ourselves like men yeah. and we end up getting overwhelmed and falling in heat, getting ill. Mm. So uh, what are you doing now these days to sort of just stay on the edge, but not push yourself to that point where you just can't yeah. go anymore? Good, thank you. Good question. So it's an interesting one because, um, yeah, I did last, uh, so what are we now, May, last, uh, I... October, November, I yeah. completely kind of fell in a heap. Like I was coming to work and kind of lying on the couch having meetings and things, and I thought, yeah. this is ridiculous. And then I looked back at I, cause, because I think I'm invincible, you know, and then I looked back <laughs> yeah. at... I like that too, though. I push myself so hard, and I have to go, oh, come back. Yeah. I don't know. 
I looked back at what had led up to it, and I am um, a journal a lot, and I I looked back through my journals because I'd been journaling every day since m- about five months pre-launch, and I realized, and I actually couldn't even read up to when we launched the magazine because I just started crying, and I thought, oh, yeah. you poor little thing. I kind of went into my whole inner child and was just like, how on earth did I get through that? And then um, I spent uh, the whole of October, I spent 31 days in... Um, traveling around the world you know promoting the mag and I remember things. that and it was crazy you were crazy. like in New York and every yeah, country I, and, yeah. I did I, I was in all through Europe and then America and you know working several different time zones and you know it was all crazy and you know it just I just had complete burnout I think and and it wasn't until I really went back through it and I was like oh my god how how did I do that to myself really mm-hmm. you know and and hindsight's a good thing and you know, and also not knowing when you begin something, what what's ahead of you is a good thing because you would never, you would never do, do it. it. <laughs> and so, um, so now I have. I mean, I was really healthy before, but now I'm. I have absolute not negotiable. So I have a personal trainer three times a week, which I'm actually going to yeah. after this. Not negotiable. Not moved for anything. Mm. Nothing. And um, every morning there's a green smoothie waiting on my desk that the girls. That sounds like such oh, a yeah. wanky. <laughs> like, diva. But, but a bit of a diva. But you know, it's about working out what works for me. And I thought yeah. I was making my own green smoothie every morning at the office, and then I was like, sometimes I'm ages. running and I don't do it. <laughs> yeah. So I know if they have it waiting for me, I'm going to drink it. And you know, and there's certain things that I just do kind of religiously now and mm. even though I you know am busy I have real downtime but the masculine feminine is interesting and I mm. think um you know sitting here I'm probably much more in my masculine energy or because I'm talking about business yeah, and yeah. risk and things uh, but it's really important and I've done a lot of reading and exploration around this and uh you know it's also really important for me to be able to drop into or any of us, you know, that feminine energy at the end of the day, you know, take off your your war face and the mask <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and be and soft be feminine, and vulnerable soft, yeah. and feminine. And, you know, I try and carry that quite consciously through my days as well. But mm. the reality is, you know, a lot of what we're doing in business is hard and fast paced mm. and it, it takes a certain amount of energy to, to be there and hold that space. Um, and my partner is an entrepreneur also yes. who is freaking amazing and um, and you know that's interesting because we are like the boy and girl version of each other and we're yeah. and we're able it's really the most beautiful relationship I've ever had because we're able to swing between that very kind of masculine talking about the entrepreneurial yeah, stuff yeah. and then drop very much for me into that whole feminine and I think yeah. Well, men have feminine energy too, yeah. of course, and he's, it, and he's does. quite like that. So we, I, I, yeah. I know Jack, <laughs> but he's yeah. he's got that, that that sense of energy about him too. So yeah. you can both drop into that yeah. space of that vulnerability and softness, yeah. and yeah. So it's I think finding that is an extraordinary thing and something very rare, and I think something to be very, you know, conscious of to have the ability to go mm. through both. And I don't think potentially I've always done that well. And uh, it's more I attractive should, for men as well. That's I think when a woman is able to switch, I think men find it attractive when we're able to drive business and go forward. But when we come home, it's really important for us that to softness. drop yeah. back in. Yeah, totally. And yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's wonderful. There's a book I read by this woman, Rory Ray, um, end of last year, and it's all about masculine and feminine. Because I think oh. I was probably previously bringing too much of that masculine energy into I think relationships a lot of us, and yeah and a lot mm. of us do you know I think particularly our women who are successful have been in the corporate world or really entrepreneurial yeah. because we're yeah. so in that masculine energy a lot we have to be yeah yeah that we forget actually that that's not really that yeah. attractive <laughs> it's not attractive and you know what so the thing is I'm it's so f- I'm such a walking you know hypocrisy in a way (laughs) because in business I absolutely believe in equality and you know I absolutely have never even just never even crossed my mind that we're not equal not once and um and I get asked about that a lot oh the glass ceiling and oh the men women thing I'm like I don't get it like I do not get it I've never once had a problem being a woman in business um but where am I going I have no idea (laughs) Yeah, so basically you're saying that you believe in equality in business. Oh, that's what I yeah. said. But in my personal life, I'm all about the chivalry. I love yeah, the door. Me too. I love the meal being paid for, you know, all that stuff. So yeah. it's kind of a bit of a dichotomy and people might think it's hypocritical or whatever, but that's, I, li- I really I don't know, I, I like that. that too. I like yeah. being a woman. I like being treated like a woman. Mm. And that doesn't mean that I'm not equal to a man. It just means I'm different. 
Yeah, absolutely. We're just different. Absolutely. Men, yeah, and we want that. That is, we should celebrate that difference. Yeah, yeah. totally. I think that's a lovely place to end our gorgeous interview. <laughs> so, if people Thank want to you. know more about Renegade Collective and about you and yes. about the business and follow you, where should they go? Well, oh, lots of different yeah. platforms <laughs> and places. But Here for a start. <laughs> the magazine, obviously, yeah. um, and then renegadecollective.com.au and yeah. my oh, then Collective Hub is our handle across all social media yeah. and Lisa Messenger also and uh, yeah and then I have my own website now lisamessenger.com dot com I think yes.com yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. great yeah which Lisa. we're about to do a relaunch on, yeah. So, yeah it's been wonderful having you on the show I'm thank so excited you. I got you before you jet off to New York oh thanks Barbara it's so, thanks always so much. gorgeous thank yeah, you yeah. beautiful <laughs> and thank you everyone again for watching for another week uh, remember you'll catch me later this week on my podcast Wealth Unplugged where I'm going to be giving my key takeouts from today's chat with Lisa there's going to be loads so make sure you get on to that also, join me next week when I'm going to be joined by the millionaire maker herself, Laurel Langmar. It's going to be a great show. See you then. Fantastic.